Good to see you here today in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We welcome any visitor we might have with us today. May the Lord bless you. And to you out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour today. And we're hoping we can be an inspiration to you. I'm going to speak today on this line of thought. The people in heaven know what's going on on the earth. That'll be my sermon subject today. Do people in heaven know what's going on on the earth? So you tell your friends about it. Get on the phone. Call them. Have them tune in. Get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. And we'll try to be a blessing to everyone. This is Preacher Edward speaking. To you have your Bible today, you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. While you're turning there, I want you to keep these thoughts in mind. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to the station where you're now listening... You can get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock noon. I hope you tune in and get this daily broadcast. Everywhere we go, we see people that tell us about getting the Sunday morning broadcast, and many of them the daily broadcast. And we have many cassette tape. Now, the tape that I'll be making today is the tape, of course, tape number 184. Do people in heaven know what's going on here on the earth? That's tape number 184. You get that along with the music. And other tape for $3 each, of course. And the $3 for each tape is used to help defray the radio expense. We have a hundred and about 178 listed, I believe. We'd glad like to send you a list of these tapes. Just write in and say, Preacher Edward, send me a list of your tape. And then if you'd like to have some of Brother John Bruce's instrumental numbers on the piano, you can get them from him. And he's uh, doing a good job on the piano. Just write John W. Bruce. That's John W. Bruce, 885 Oak Grove Road, Athens, Georgia, 30607. That's 885 Oak Grove Road, Athens, Georgia, 30607. And then you can get the musical tape. They're $3 each. And if you want to call him, you might call 543-3989. 543-3989. That's uh, Brother John Bruce. You know, there's a lot of things not worth talking about or doing and some that's very important. Mind me the old bulldog, the mean bulldog jumped on a skunk, a polecat, bit down on the polecat and the polecat gassed him real good. So he politely laid him down, walked off and laid down in the shade. Another dog came along and asked him, said, well, why didn't you finish him off? He said, it's just not worth it. So a lot of times you find things that are just not worth it and then some things that need to be told and need to be taken care of. Some things need to be left off. Now, last Sunday, I told you about the little 10-year-old girl that was kidnapped down in Columbia, South Carolina. I was down there at a meeting, and a man came by and grabbed this little 10-year-old girl and put it in his automobile and took off. And the very sad family, the pastor and I visited the family, the poor dad walked up and down the road and through the woods crying, trying to find his little daughter. And uh, before that happened, uh, two other young women had been kidnapped and they found their bodies where they'd been uh, raped and abused and they found their bodies of the two women. I called the pastor. I said, Pastor, we want to know about the little 10-year-old girl. Whatever happened, he said, they found her little body. She had been abused. They found a little body near the place where they found the other two women. Said they have a man in custody. Don't know for sure whether it's, he's the guilty party or not. And I want to say this. If he's the guilty man... They ought to take him out and break his infernal neck. Yeah. This terrible judicial system we have today that stinks, rotten to make a buzzard, gurgling tape, put him in jail, feed him, these appeal courts. They ought to take him out immediately and break his neck immediately. He said he thought he had some mental problems, but about 30 minutes in a good red-hot electric chair with all the force turned on to take care of those mental problems. Now, we are playing around and fooling around with this business of criminals today and that's why little innocent girls that are picked up in front of their homes like this little girl playing there beside of a little home where she lived, the, the mobile home, jumped out, picked her up and threw it in the car and hit her and she's screaming and run off and they found her abused body this past week. Now that's terrible. That's terrible. It's going to get worse. And I'll tell you one thing that's encouraging. It. Like that bunch of liberals and infidels that met up here at the state capitol yesterday to oppose capital punishment. Now that crowd is anti-Bible, anti-God, anti-true Americanism. They're a bunch of liberals, they're a bunch of infidels. Had two little sissy-looking 
uh, supposed to be ministers standing there with their collars turned back. It reminded me of two jackasses trying to find their mama somewhere in a crowd of people over a white fence. Now, men like that are not called of God to preach. And that crowd that gather there are a bunch of infidels and a bunch of liberals. Now, people, you say, Brother Edwards, how do you know the infidels? The Bible said all the Bible's in spite of God. And a man that doesn't believe the Bible's in spite of God is an infidel. And they don't believe that because the Bible teaches capital punishment and the Bible teaches a death penalty. They say, well, we're just, they're just putting too many poor people to death. I don't care whether they're poor, whether they're rich, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're yellow, whether they're pink or what color they are. If they commit the crime, then they are to be put to death. That's stupid. That's an insult to the average person's intelligence to say now we are protesting because they put too many poor people to death. That's stupid. If that poor man commits the crime worthy of death, put him to death. The Bible says so. And we need to put the person to death like the Word of God said. And that about 200 of them, uh, they're repulsive to even look at. I saw a picture of them on TV. And you can just look the crowd over and size them up, brother. I mean, you can size them. I wouldn't want that bunch of jaybirds around me at any time if I could get away from them. I most certainly wouldn't want them to try to pray for them because they know nothing about God. They know nothing about the Bible. And they are encouraging crime in America. They are partly responsible. People like that are partly responsible for the kidnapping and raping and murder of that 10-year-old child and other people who have to suffer, law-abiding citizens who have to suffer because of the ACLU and that crowd that's going around protesting of the death penalty. They are, they are moving and acting contrary to the Word of God. They know nothing about the Bible. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe the infallibility of the Word of God. They're a bunch of jerks as far as I'm concerned. And they are helping to encourage crime. And if you don't like it, you're welcome. You can leap it, lump it, leave it. Or do whatever you please. It's truth anyhow. I'll tell you, it makes my blood boil. And these liberal appeal court judges, the crooked rascals, you can buy them over and sentence somebody to death. And then they'll turn around and get another new trial and turn them loose. And they'll face God in the judgment. And the judge that they're going to face is not going to turn them loose. And then you have a lot of juries today uh, with um, no backbone. And they will turn criminals loose. And they go out and kill other people. And they'll give an account for every crime that's committed after they turn them loose. Now the word of God is clear all the way through the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. If a man takes another man's life he's to be punished. And God said I'll tell you exactly how he ought to be punished. And his punishment should be death. Now you say, preacher, now do you, you think uh, that deters crime? Yes, sir. Not only that, but God said do it. And what God said do, then do it. Put him to death. That's his punishment. Clean off death row. Grumbling around about not having room to put people in prison. If they'd clean off death row and go ahead and put them to death like the, they're sentenced to die, then they'd have some more room. And as soon as a man is sentenced to death, put him to death. Don't play around about that thing. Beloved, listen to me. That's the reason when the mess we're in today and the reason we're having so much crime and the reason innocent families are having to suffer today and losing their precious loved ones because these criminals are turned to loose and our rotten judicial system is rotten and stinks to high heaven and something ought to be done about it and I'm willing to do what I can about it and I hope you are. All right, I'm not charging anything for that. That's not my message. That's my introduction. Now you turn, would you please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to read a verse of Scripture to conserve time. I fully intended to have read the entire chapter, but I want you to turn to page 1224. If you find it on page 1213, uh, then, I mean 1223, turn to page 1224. Do people in heaven know what's going on here on the earth? In verse 12, the Bible says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I want you to let that verse of Scripture sink in. Down here on this earth, we are like a people looking through a darkened glass. A glass that's been darkened, a shaded. But when we go to heaven face to face with our dear Lord, we're going to know then as we are known. Now how are we known? God knows all about us. He knows what's happening on the earth. And we're going to know as we are known by the Lord. 
David, of course, we all know that. God knows what's going on on the earth. Nothing is hid from God. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. Now let that sink in. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3 said, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, not some places, but every place, beholding the evil and the good. And Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the weakness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, according to that scripture, God knows the thoughts of our hearts. We don't have to say the words or do the act. Just think them in our hearts, and God knows about that. That's not a thought, good or evil, in the heart and mind of any individual, but what God doesn't know about it. Now, you need to remember that God is God. There's nothing impossible with the Lord. He knows all things. He knows all the billions of stars and knows them all by name. He knows every hair that you have on your head. He knows the number of every hair on everybody's head all over this world. Some five billion people, he knows how many hairs they have on each head. God knows it because he's God. See, I'm talking about a person that's God. I'm not talking about just mere man. God knows all things. And so he knows the very thoughts of your heart, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Number two, the devil knows what's going on here on the earth. Now, the devil is an intelligent creature for evil, of course. But he knows these things, and he's powerful, and he's second to God. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and walking up and down in it. See, the devil was taking a walk on the earth back in the days of Job. He was checking out Job. He, he knows things that's happening on the earth. Now, he knows all about that before he came down to the earth. He knew all about Job, and he came down and had to look him over. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, here Jesus said Satan desired to have Simon Peter. Now, the Lord knew that, that Satan knew all about Simon. The Lord knew that Satan knew that Simon was going to be one of the great apostles. He knew that, and he desired to have him. Satan knew that Simon would be a natural-born leader. Now, some people are just born with that gift. They're just natural-born leaders. Now, you'd have to agree with that. Some people are just couldn't lead at all. But some people are natural-born leaders. And so Simon Peter was that kind of a feller. He, well, he had the ability to take the initiative, just naturally lead the other disciples, and the devil knew that. And the devil said, I want to knock that key apostle out. I want to sift him. I want to get my hands. I, I want to work him over. I want to see. I, I want to do away with him because I know what he's going to do. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible said, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Now, who is that accuser? That accuser is none other than Satan, the devil. He accuses the brethren before God day and night. See, the devil knows what you're doing. He knows what Christians are doing. He knows what sinners are doing. He knows all about it. And he accuses you when you do something wrong. The devil knows that, and he goes before the Lord and accuses you before the Lord. He is an accuser of the brethren. The devil knows what's happening on this earth. He knows what's happening in America. He knows what's happening yonder in the Middle East, in the Far East, and all over the world, in Russia, and everywhere the devil knows what's happening. He keeps a, a good eye on everything, and he knows all about it. And so we see God knows what's happening on the earth. The devil knows what's happening on the earth. And the angels know what's going on here on the earth. That's thought number three. The angels in heaven know what's going on here upon the earth. In Psalms chapter 34 and verse 7, And the angel of the Lord are camped around about them that fear him, and delivereth them. And so the angels know. Now, somebody said one time, My precious little baby died, and now it's gone to be an angel in heaven. No, no, no. If your little baby died, it'll never be an angel. It has a far higher position in heaven than angels. Angels are God's creative beings. 
The human race has been redeemed by God's precious blood. Little children go there through his mercy. Your child or your loved one will never be an angel. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11 said, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now this happened on the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus there was hungry. hungry. He, he had spent some 40 days and nights on the mountain of temptation. And at the close of the 40 days and nights, the devil came and tempted him. And when Jesus overcame the devil with the word of God, then after the devil left, the angels came flocking in. Say they, they knew all about what the devil was doing. They knew the devil was tempting Jesus. They knew all about that. And no sooner had the devil gone and left Jesus there on the mountain of temptation, until here they come. They knew all about that. So angels in heaven know all about it. The Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. So the angels know. And then number four, Moses and Elijah knew what was going on on the earth after they went to heaven. Now Elijah went to heaven in a chariot of fire and a whirlwind and the horses of fire. He was walking along with Elisha and he knew God was going to take him away that day. And God sent a chariot down after him. Isn't that something? God sent a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Here come those horses pulling that beautiful golden chariot. And the prophet Elijah stepped right in, waved goodbye to Elisha, dropped his mantle, and Elijah went right on to heaven in that chariot of fire and those horses of fire. Went right on from the earth, right into heaven, drove right on into heaven in the chariot and the horses of fire. Isn't that something? And so he was in heaven a while. But before he went to heaven, uh, we have another man that went there that's not without great significance. And that man was Moses. Now Moses in the Bible represents the law of God. Elijah represents the prophets of God. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. God wanted two men in heaven for a specific reason. He wanted one that represented the law. He wanted one that represented the prophets. And he carried Elijah on, and then Moses died, and Moses went up on Mount Nebo and died. And when he died, nobody knew where his grave was. God had him buried. God buried him up there. Nobody attended his funeral. They couldn't even find the grave of Moses after he died. Nobody knew. That was that great leader that led millions of people, went up on Mount Nebo, and there died and was buried. Now when Jesus went up on the mountain in order to, uh, to uh, uh, talk with God the Father upon the mountain, he went up on top of this mountain and there he was, uh, Peter, James, and John, and he was there with Peter, James, and John on the high mountain. I've been up there. It's a terrible high mountain, a great high mountain. And I went up there and I've been there and they have a tabernacle up there. And you know, Simon Peter said, let's build three tabernacles. He wanted to build three. They do have one up there. But anyway, in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3, Now while Jesus up there on this mountain, on Mount Tabor, Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So when Jesus was on this mountain, the glory of God overshadowed him. And when disciples got a good look at what they thought they saw, they didn't see just Jesus, they saw two more people there. And they recognized them, and one of them was Moses, and the other was Elijah. Yeah. See, Moses and Elijah in heaven knew what was happening on the earth. They knew that Jesus was on Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. And there they came down to join Jesus. Now, they didn't come down just to tell jokes. And they didn't come down to talk about something that happened back in the days of Elisha. They came down for a purpose. They had one mission in mind. One goal in mind. When they stepped down from heaven and stepped down upon Mount Tabor, Mount Hermon, whichever one it was, they had one, one mission, one goal in mind. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 9 and verse 31. And this is their mission. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now here we find Moses and Elijah came down to talk with Jesus about his crucifixion. That was one of the greatest events that ever took place in the history of mankind. All of heaven was concerned about the crucifixion and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. All the earth was concerned about it. 
All hell was concerned about it. Everything is centered around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. God the Father said, Moses, yes, sir. Elijah, yes, sir. I want you to go down to the top of the mountain. My son down there, Jesus, he's there. And with him, he has three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And I want you to go down there and just talk with Jesus about that crucifixion. Now, the Son of God faced that cross. It wasn't necessarily the cross that he uh, uh, disliked. It was being made sin is what troubled him. He was to drink the bitter dregs of sin. He was to be made sin for us. All the sins of the entire world from the very beginning of Adam to the end of the millennium, all of them was to be poured out upon Jesus at Calvary. And that's what he dreaded. That's what he meant when he said, Father, if it be thy will... Let this cup pass me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. And so it was a sin question that bothered Jesus. Not the whipping, not the spittle, not the plucking out of the beard, not the nailing to the cross, but the sin situation. Being made sin was a cup that he had to drink. And so the father said, go down and talk with him. And Moses and Elijah, representing the Lord and the prophets, came down and they sat there and they talked about this crucifixion in Jerusalem. Would you like to have a tape recording of that? I would really like to have a tape recording of that conversation. Wouldn't that be something? Just to hear what Moses and Elijah said to Jesus about it and what he said back to them about it. And he talked with them about that. So they knew what was happening on the earth. Let's move on to thought number five. And that is, past heroes of faith know what's going on here on the earth. Now you jot down this verse of scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 Wherefore, seeing we also are come about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now that verse of Scripture tells us that we're compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Talking about God's people. Who are those great cloud of witnesses? Some Bible scholars believe they might be our loved ones in heaven. Some Bible scholars believe that who the great cloud of witness, witnesses are. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17, Elijah, Elisha rather, sitting beside the mountain, while he was in the battle with the Assyrians, and there he had his servant. And his servant was trembling in his boots. His servant was scared half to death. And Elisha said to him, what's the matter you? He said, I'm afraid all, all these Assyrians around here, and we are bound to be captured, we're bound to be killed. And uh, what are we going to do, Elisha? I'm afraid. I'm terribly afraid. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17, you have the answer. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. See, he prayed that God open his servant's eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man he saw. And behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots and fire around about Elisha. Now that prophet, that servant couldn't sit. There was a fire all around Elisha. Big blaze of fire. Who wanted to come through that fire? All over that mountain there, there were horses and chariots of angels sitting over there full of horses and chariots of fire, had chariots of fire and horses of fire and all those angels all around those Mounting sides all around Elisha, all around his servant. How in the world could those Assyrians ever penetrate that? They could not. But that servant didn't know that. He didn't know that. And Elisha knew God had him protected. Now, beloved, listen to me. We don't know how many angels may be right here in this auditorium, but you can't see them with a naked eye. You don't know how many angels are watching over you and guiding you and keeping you from harm and danger. You can't see them with a naked eye. If God should open your eye, you might be surprised at what you'd see around you. And so that's what happened here. This servant didn't see a thing. All he saw was a mountain, mountain here, mountain there. And Elijah said, now Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes, horses of fire, chariots of fire all around them. And not an Assyrian could ever penetrate that those angels. On one occasion, the angels took off and killed 185,000 of those Assyrians. Angels did that. All right, let's move on. Number six, saints in heaven will know what is going on here on the earth during the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, the saints of God 
in the paradise of God will know what's happening down here. Now check this verse of scripture. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And when he opened the fierce seal, I saw on the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The people that will be in the paradise of God at the altar of God during the tribulation period is going to know what's happening on the earth down here. And they're going to say, Lord, how long now are you going to avenge our blood on those people down there that uh, mistreated you and your servants and put us to death during the tribulation? How long, Lord, is that going to last? See, they knew exactly what was happening. They knew God is pouring out his wrath. That God was dealing with the people on the earth. They had put saints of God to death. They had defied and blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ. They had rejected the Lord. Now God was pouring it up on them. Pouring it up on them. The wrath of God. And so these people that's already went to heaven because they were killed and went on up there to the altar of God. They wondered how long are you going to continue to do that Lord? Now the answer is it did since the seven year tribulation period. The last three and a half worse than the first three and a half years. And God had a certain time element there, no doubt about that. But they knew. They knew what was taking place. And they knew. And they wondered how much more longer they'd have to wait before God finished that ordeal. Now, we come to number seven. Abraham and Dives talked about people upon the earth. If you read Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 29, you'll find an inmate of hell. And Abraham, there in the paradise of God, and there's a gulf between them. And they talked about things on the earth. The Bible said, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that I would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Now this rich man in hell knew he had five lost brothers. He knew that. He knew that. Now, one of them probably could have gotten saved and went on to be with the Lord. No, he knew he had five lost brothers. And people in hell today, if they have left lost loved ones here, they know they have those lost loved ones on the earth. And they are far more concerned about it than we are. But there's nothing they can do about it. We're the only ones who can do anything about it. They can't do a thing about it. And they are concerned about their lost loved ones on this earth. Every inmate in hell would give anything in the world if they could come back and go to their loved ones and tell them about that terrible place and tell them to get saved, but they can't do it. They can't do it. And people in hell know about their lost loved ones on the earth. And then we come to the final thought, and that is, number eight, people in heaven know when a sinner repents. When a person gets saved, people in heaven know about it. In Luke chapter 15, verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy and the presence of of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now it didn't say the angels were rejoicing. Of course I think they were. But there's some people in the presence of the angels. Now who are those people in the presence of the angels of God? It's your loved ones and my loved ones. Amen. Some good mother went to heaven. She prayed for her daughter and her son before she died. And later on they got saved and she was informed about it. And she rejoiced about it. She shouted and praised God that her boy got saved. She shouted and praised God that her daughter got saved. And they rejoice about that. And they're concerned about that. And there's people in heaven that prayed for others for many, many years. And then they went on and died before they got saved. And when they got saved, they knew about it. There's a man one time prayed for a man for 40 years. And the man that did the praying died. And then shortly after he died, shortly after the burial, then the man he prayed for got saved. Yes, sir. I believe the man that prayed for him for 40 years knew about it and shouted the victory. There's more going on from heaven today pertaining to this earth than you realize. We are connected up. We are, we are connected in. We're in touch with heaven. Yeah. And there's more in heaven today that know more about you down here than you ever dreamed of. The people in heaven know what's going on on the earth. I have given you the message. This message on cassette tape is tape number 184. If you want the tape, write it and get it. You're out in the radio listening on it. It's $3 each. And doing these hot summer days, vacationing time, is a struggle to stay on the air of our faith. And your support is appreciated. 
And now I'll give you my mailing address when I go off there today, I hope. And so you write to him and pray for me. You here in the auditorium have listened well. If you're not right with God, I want you to get right with God. Because there's connection between here and heaven. And there's more in heaven concerned about what you uh, know do and what, where you are than you're aware of today. Let us all stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take this message. And that someone out in the vast radio listening audience might get saved. Some backslider might come back home to thee. And that you might speak to these here in the auditorium. Thank you, our Father, for the way they have listened. Thank you for the liberty you gave us to bring the message. And I pray now they'll be used. It'll be used for good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now Debbie's going to play on the organ as she plays. Now you listen to me. There may be some of you here that's not saved. People are dying every day. Some maybe thought way out yonder in the future, I'm going to die. Maybe died suddenly. Some of you may go like that. You have no promise of tomorrow, no lease on life. And the only safe place is to know Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, you ought to come get acquainted with him today. And if you don't have a church home, and you prefer this church to be your home, feel free to come forward. If you're a backslider, and you want to come back to God, you feel free to come forward. If any other reason... I have a mission that you want to respond to, then you do so at Debbie Place. How about it today while we wait? Just another moment playing, David, just play another moment or two. Somebody may be almost persuaded to come.